Welcome to our reflections on the book of Revelation. In this episode, I want to go into chapter two of the book of Revelation and see what Jesus does in his discernment about the health of the church. It's very important. We're going to uh, discover in chapter 19 and verse eight that the, the church has made herself ready and has her dazzling garment on her bridal robe. So we now need to see, is the church actually ready? Her husband is on his way back. If you remember John 14 verses one and two, it was given in terms of a Jewish wedding that I am going away and I will come back and take you with me. And so for a Jewish wedding, the bridegroom would go away and he would prepare the place where they were to, to live and the bride would make herself ready for that particular time and she would prepare all that was necessary in terms of linens and so on. So Jesus has gone back to the Father in the resurrection and he is now going to return and so he wants, he hopes his bride is ready. And so uh, there's going to be a new era uh, of the kingdom of God on earth and it's the time when the Our Father will be fulfilled and God's uh, will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So even if you do a cursory reading of uh, chapters two and three, it certainly comes across to you that the bride is certainly not ready, anything but. So let me sort of give you a general introduction to this. The messages to the seven churches deal with the daily life of that particular church as if no other church existed. The messages deal with the decisions that that church is making and that they have far-reaching consequences in time and in eternity. Each message is, comes directly from Christ, who is the head of the church. Uh, it is delivered to John, who is the, not only the leader of the church, but the prophet of the church as well. And through John, it's given to the congregation. That's the way messages have been given to us all down the centuries. And so John is the terrestrial angel who carries this message to the church. Now, each message begins with the prophetic, thus says the Lord uh, formula, and each one ends with an exhortation for that particular congregation to hear what is being said. And then finally, uh, each message encourages those who will actually deal with the issues, uh, those who will conquer. Therefore, what we're being told is that the church has got to get ready rather quickly for a spiritual battle that is ahead. In this uh, spiritual battle, they've got to fight the good fight, as St. Paul said, and they've got to wear all the armour of Christ, as St. Paul told them as well in Ephesians chapter 6. When you look at the discernment that is done on the seven churches, you can actually come to a conclusion, which is rather interesting for me anyway, and that is that Ephesus and Laodicea, that's the first one and the seventh one, are in serious trouble. The second one, which is Smyrna, and the sixth one, which is Philadelphia, uh, they are in good shape. And the third one, uh, which is Pergamum, and the fifth one, which is Sardis, are indifferent and sleepy churches or dead or dying, and they're in real trouble. And then uh, Theatra is the fourth one, the smallest congregation, and receives the longest message from the Lord. Why? She's corrupt. So that is what I want to illustrate. So this is the overall uh, picture of what you will find there. So let's come to the first one, uh, and it's the Church of Ephesus. And of all the messages to the churches, I find this one the most tragic. Ephesus was the most important uh, city in Asia uh, at the time John was speaking. It was a very important seaport uh, where international commerce passed through all the time. There were approximately 150,000 people uh, resident there. The church was founded by St. Paul and his team, and he was the great missionary of love, which you can read about it in Acts chapter 19 and 20. They received a letter from St. Paul and his, his team, the letter to the Ephesians, and I want to read something that Paul actually said to them, which will tell you the tragedy of what we're reading in the book of Revelation, because St. Paul was urging them to reach 
the perfection in love. So this is uh, St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians chapter 3 from verse 14 to 21. This then is what I pray, kneeling before the Father from whom every family, whether spiritual or natural, takes its name. Out of his infinite glory, may he give you the power through his spirit for your hidden life to grow strong, so that God may live in your hearts through faith and then planted in love and built on love, you will, like all the saints, have the strength to grasp the breadth and the length, the height and the depth, until knowing the love of Christ, which is beyond all knowledge, meaning all human knowledge, you are filled with the utter fullness of God. Glory be to him whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we would ever ask or imagine. Glory be to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. That glorious text that we all love and we will all love completely fulfilled in ourselves that was written to this church in Ephesus. Not only did they have this wonderful teaching from Paul, uh, but Timothy was a bishop there uh, for a time as well. You will read this in 1 Timothy 1.3. Not only that, but John the Apostle was uh, the leader in the church in Ephesus for many years up to his death. Uh, and he was the great mystic of love. And on top of all of that, John brought Jesus' mother, our holy blessed mother, to live there uh, with him at Ephesus until it was time for her to depart from the earth. Our blessed mother was the spouse of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of love. So this community had been extraordinarily gifted in its stars, in its leadership, uh, in the people who founded the church, the people who uh, led the church, the people who fed the church. They had the most wonderful models. And yet it's the very thing that Ephesus fails in is love. It's really, really, really sad. And so to whom much is given, much is expected. And yet the tragedy is that when Jesus comes to look at this church, he calls her dead, or as we would say, on life support. It's really, really sad because a church without love is dead. Ephesus was a very religious uh, city, uh, but they were quite mixed up between religion and magic. And also they had uh, the uh, pagan temples there as well. And the pagan goddess Artemis was very much uh, worshipped in Ephesus, created terrible trouble for Paul when he was there. So the message that is given to each church is individual and it's very important. And some aspect of the vision of Jesus in chapter one is in the message to each one of the churches. In other words, different congregations are meant to actually bring forth different aspects of the mystery of Christ and present that to the world. So in the individual message to each uh, church, Jesus shows them something about himself that they should be living. For example, in chapter one, verse 18, Jesus is the living one and Ephesus is a dead one. That's really bad. So the message to Ephesus then comes from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who lives in the midst of the golden lampstands. Therefore, Jesus is actually living in his church. He lives with the church in his word, in his Eucharist, and in the personal prayer of all the uh, individual members. When you go to Matthew 18, 20, Jesus said, where two or three of you gather together, I am in the midst of you. So he is living in the midst of the churches. He is actually living in Ephesus. He's living in heaven, but he's also living on earth in the church. So Jesus comes to Ephesus as the supreme authority of the church and the congregation must listen and must obey. And he has come to warn them. And he says the ominous thing, I know all about you the good and the bad and the indifferent. Jesus' eyes, the burning flames of chapter 1, verse 14, can penetrate every issue, every person, every thought, every word, every action, every event 
everything it's known to God. We cannot hide from God. It's not actually possible for us to hide from God. God knows us better than we know ourselves. So Jesus' perfect knowledge and his perfect understanding is going to uh, speak to this church, giving praise where it is due and giving blame where it is due as well. Nothing out of proportion, everything within God's order. So Jesus says three things to this congregation. First of all, that they work hard. And John uses uh, uh, the word kopos, which means uh, really hard labor to the point of weariness. So they really do work. Jesus says, I know how much you put up with. In other words, they are patient in suffering. And I know you've handled false teachers, which was good. The early church had a complete horror of heresy. And St. Paul had warned them roundly uh, in Acts chapter 20 from verse 17 to 38, which I want to look at now. He told them that they would be attacked. And he told this particular church, he actually addressed these words to the church of Ephesus. And this is in the middle of his final speech to the church of Ephesus, Acts chapter 20 from verse 28. Be on your guard for yourselves and for all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you the overseers, to feed the church of God which he bought with his own blood. I know quite well that when I have gone, fierce wolves will invade you and will have no mercy on the flock. Even from your own ranks, there will be men coming forward with a travesty of the truth on their lips to induce disciples to follow them. Be on your guard as I have, he said, and so on. So there was Paul warning them solidly about the, the, the false teachers and so on. So they've managed to handle that pretty well, which is good, and the Lord acknowledges it. But there is something really drastic wrong with Ephesus. And it's described very well by both Jeremiah and Hosea. When Jeremiah really lamented that the people of God uh, in the Old Testament had really failed in love, he said, and this is Jeremiah 2, 2. The Lord says this, I remember the affection of your youth. I remember the love of your bridal days. You followed me through the wilderness, through a land unsown, and Israel was sacred to the Lord. Now that is a husband grieving that his wife no longer loves him, okay? And in the prophet, uh, Hosea chapter 2, I'll only read a couple of verses of this for you as well, because it pertains to what is actually coming, which is the tribulation that is needed uh, to try and keep Ephesus alive. That is why I'm going to lure her and lead her out into the wilderness and speak to her heart. I'm going to give her back her vineyards and make the valley of Achor, that's the place of suffering, a gateway of hope. There she will respond to me as she did when she was young as she did when she came out of the land of Egypt. In other words, you'll go back to your first love. So what the Lord is uh, lamenting here is that Ephesus has actually abandoned its first love. So a church without love is actually dead. And so what John needs to tell this congregation in Ephesus is that Jesus Christ, who is in incarnate love and lived among us as incarnate love will not support a loveless body. In other words, they're in danger of uh, losing their right to be a church. And the reason for this is that the essence of Christianity is love. God is love, 1 John 4, 7. Love is the greatest law in the Bible, Jesus told us in Matthew 24, verses 9 to 13. Jesus commanded us to love one another in John 13, 34. Jesus told us that we were to love like him. In other words, it was agape love, it was divine love, it was unconditional love, it was sacrificial love that we were to give, not just ordinary feelings. John 15, 9. The church was to grow to the perfection of love as I have read for you in Ephesians 3, 14 to 21. So to fail in love, was to fail completely to be a Christian. It's really, really sad. It's really sad. It's like a, a teacher uh, 
uh, giving marks to a student and actually writing on their paper, no grade. There's no marks whatsoever. So what the prophets of Israel taught us in the Old Testament was that as soon as people begin to forget God, they will fall into immorality and idolatry. That is, instead of being a bride, you become a harlot in biblical terms. And you'll find that in Jeremiah 2.13, Hosea 2.15 and Judges 8.34. Now, since Ephesus has forgotten the love of Jesus, we know that disaster lies ahead because even if they never had any invasion, even if they never had any persecution coming to them, the world, the flesh and the devil is there to gobble them up. And they're the three great enemies of the soul. But there is heresy in Ephesus. Uh, and this is the problem of what John calls the Nicolaitans. So these are uh, people who followed a man called Nicholas. We don't know if he is the Nicholas that was actually anointed in Acts chapter 6. We don't have any proof of it. It's just that the name is the same. These people who followed this man uh, taught the false doctrines which make people compromise their faith and their morality. So these Nicolaitans represent the bad seed, the enemy within the darnel that we have spoken about before. And so uh, Jesus used very strong language in dealing with them. I hate what they are doing because they're destroying the church. So the spiritual damage that's coming from this false teaching is great. It's the enemy within the church. And uh, John spoke about this, I read it for you already in 1 John 2, 18 to 19, about the Antichrists, the people working against Christ already in the church. But I want to show you one from uh, 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 to 15. There, Paul says, These people are counterfeit apostles. They're dishonest workmen disguised as the apostles of Christ. There's nothing unexpected about this, of course. If Satan himself goes disguised as an angel of light, surely his servants will imitate him. Okay, so the apostles have been dealing with this problem uh, right from the very beginning, because as Jesus warned us uh, that Satan would sow darnel among the wheat. But Jesus makes a promise to each church that if they would deal with the problems that they have, uh, that he would make real promises for them. And so uh, he says that the overcomers, they're the ones who would deal with the problems, that they would actually be given special gifts from the Lord. So as we uh, journey through the apocalypse, we will witness Jesus dealing with the problems that are in the church and in the world as well until he comes to final victory. And he told us already in John 16, 33, I have overcome the world. So there's the model that's given to the church. Go and deal with the world that is among you, the flesh that is among you, the devil that is among you. Go and deal with them. I did it and you are part of me. You have my grace, you have my redemption, you have absolutely everything I've made available to you. So the church is not on its own dealing with this stuff. And so, the, Jesus wants his church victorious over all these difficulties and trials, just as he was uh, victorious over all the trials and difficulties that came to him. So if they would reach out and deal with the problems that are actually there, Jesus promises as the new Adam that he would allow them feed from the tree of life. Now, everything that's promised to the churches in chapters 2 and 3, you'll actually find in chapters 21 and 22. So the tree of life is in chapter 22 uh, from verse 2. Unfortunately, like Capernaum, where Jesus worked so many miracles, there's no Ephesus today. There's only a ruin. And so the, the big, big challenge that is given to the rest of us is that you may have great saints who started your church. You may have a great people teaching you, but that's no guarantee that you will walk in their footsteps. The Pharisees had told Jesus, we have Abraham for our father. And Jesus respond, no, you don't. You're following a completely different father than Abraham. You are totally rejecting the one that God has sent. 
They did the exact opposite of Abraham. Instead of following Abraham in faith and in complete surrender to God, they actually killed the messenger that God sent to them. So they were very different. So none of us can boast that uh, we had great saints to start our church. We have to become saints. Thank you for listening. Sláin agus bánach dé live. Goodbye. God bless you. Are you searching for purpose of life? Discover your true identity. Stay tuned to Shalom World.